So on that note, uh, you've just seen him on, on a video, but here he is in person. It's Dave Mitchell. Um, do you mind if I pray for you? Cool. Lord, thank you so much for Dave. Thank you for everything that you are doing in him, everything that you're doing through him. Lord, I pray that you would um, you'd speak through him this morning. And would you give us ears to hear uh, what you're saying to us, Lord? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's a real privilege to be with this congregation at the start of prayer week. This is where it all began for the Woodlands Church family, and it's great to be with you today. I've only got one jumper, that's why it's on the video as well. Um, <laughs> now, when, when we think about prayer, the way we think about God will affect the way that we pray. Um, I, I remember Stephen Fry saying, Stephen Fry, as a well-known atheist, don't say grace for my food, and it's a bit frustrating not having anyone to thank for it. <laughs> because if you don't believe there is a God, then you're not going to pray to God. And for the Jewish people, um, their understanding of God affected the way that they prayed. But because for the Jews, the name of God, does anyone actually tell me, what was the name of God that the, the Jewish people used? Yahweh, yeah, exactly. It's, it's a, a rather inscrutable name. It's a name that you don't really know how to pronounce. It's got no vowels in it. It's a name that, that symbolizes something of the mystery of God and the remoteness of God. And when God is a bit remote, when we are not quite sure that we've got um, a comfortable relationship with God, it probably affects the way that we pray. And I think it's very easy when we're a bit in awe of God and, and a little bit maybe even afraid of God to pray in a way that has reservations about it. Now, when, when Jesus came on earth, he came to show us what the heart of God was really like. He came to that we might know the Father heart of God. And for, for Jesus, his name for God wasn't Yahweh. That's not how we read him praying. We, we, we read him saying a very different name, which was? Abba, right. So just if you look at it spelt and, and written down, or if you say it out loud, Yahweh, Jehovah, those are kind of big, they're big words, aren't they? But Abba, Abba, Abba is a very easy thing to say. And the reason is because it's the very first word a little Aramaic baby would, would say for daddy, Abba. And it's a word that the smallest, youngest person can pray, to call God Abba. That's, that's the word that Jesus used. That's the word that Jesus gave us when we pray. In fact, in the Lord's Prayer, he said, when you pray, say Abba. Start intimate, start small. And when Jesus was talking about prayer, he, and talking about God as well, he understands the fears and reservations that we have about God that might affect the way that we pray. So one of the fears we might have about God is that when we ask for good gifts, we may not get them. When we ask for blessing, it may be that that's a bit cheeky of us to ask God for stuff for ourselves. In fact, I know a number of people feel like it's okay to pray for worthy things. It's all, all right to pray for other people, but it's not really okay to pray for myself. In fact, I was in a small group this week, and someone in the small group said, oh, no, I can't pray for myself. It, it, I don't know if anyone's had that kind of fear or reservation. But Jesus told a story, and it was a story about a father who might be giving good gifts or not to the children. And he said in Luke chapter 11, which of you children, if your son asks you for a fish, will give him a snake? If he asks for bread, will give him a scorpion? If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit, or in Matthew's version, to give good gifts to those who ask him. So I guess that's Jesus wanted dealing with the fear that we have, that we might project onto this big, slightly unknowable God. If God is remote and distant and out there, it's easy to, to project onto God fear and to feel that if we ask him for something good, he's not going to give us. In fact, he might punish us for being cheeky. We've asked him for bread, he's given us a scorpion. And Jesus is at pains to say, no, he's not like that. You know how much you want to bless your children. I guess if you're a mum or a dad here today, you really want to bless your children. You want to give them good gifts. You want them to thrive. You know, when it's your, 
their birthdays, when it's um, Christmas, you want to have something to give a, a nice gift to them. You want, you want them to, to, to have enough to do life well. And, and Jesus is the, the one who says, God is the how much more. How much more of a loving father is he than you are? How much more is he like a loving mother than you are? So that's reassuring for us as we pray. That when we pray, we can ask God for things. And we can bring our needs to God. We can bring our requests. In fact, Jesus modeled that all the time. He was often saying to people, what do you want me to do for you? I, I, you know the story of someone like blind Bartimaeus, a blind man. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus brings him out. What do you want me to do for you? I want to see. It's a bit selfish, isn't it? No, Jesus says, receive your healing. Receive your sight. And Jesus shows us, not by his teaching alone, but also by the way he lived. This is what God's like. He's rich in blessing. He loves to bless people. Not because we deserve it, but because his heart's full. Jesus also tells a story um, in Luke chapter 18, uh, again about God and prayer. And in this story, the picture is of a, of a, of a widow who is a powerless woman who is, has a need for justice. And the person who's required to give her justice is unjust, corrupt, lazy. She has no influence on him. She can't bribe him. She's got nothing to say. So she just keeps coming to him day after day and says, give me justice against my adversary. And the judge says in that story, oh, she's wearing me out. I'm going to grant her justice. And Jesus says there, he's the how much more judge. God's the how much more judge. You know, how much more, if, if, if you get justice from an unjust judge, because you keep asking, how much more will your Father in heaven grant justice and speedily? But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? That's what Jesus says in Luke chapter 18. Now, honestly, sometimes we project onto God a fear that God is an unjust judge. Or maybe he's not an unjust judge, he's just a judge. And that's his key attribute, that he's watching over us, he's He's scoring us for how well we've behaved. You know, he's like the kind of, you know, Father Christmas, if you've been good, you get gifts at Christmas. He's a bit like that, only more so. And, uh, you know, we're afraid to pray because we feel like we don't deserve it. We've not kept our part of the bargain and that God will, will be keeping account. In fact, the Bible says about God that mercy triumphs over judgment, that the attribute of mercy in God's heart is more important to him than anything else. And that God is not like an unjust judge who is going to not give us justice. He's not like a judge who's going to keep a score and stop us um, because we've not been good enough to earn our blessings. In fact, he's like somebody who wants to bring us aid where we are powerless. He's a God who wants to help us. And so when Jesus talks about prayer and encourages us to pray, he tells us to pray. Our Father, our Father who is not like a harsh father, who's not like an unjust judge, who's not like a fickle or capricious father, is a father whose steadfast love and mercy we can depend on. And so it may be that we have those fears about God. It may be that our own experience of father has not been ideal and father has been distant or angry or violent even and so it's hard for us to relate to a God who is called father but is full of love and mercy but that's what Jesus invites us to do and he invites us to do it by demonstrating this is what the father's like as well as by teaching this is what the father's like and and when we come to pray the Lord's prayer is so helpful isn't it and I know that you're, you're looking at that um, in your series at the moment but that starting point our father being our Abba. It's almost too intimate for us. You know, I find calling God Daddy a bit tricky. I, I, I like to call God Father, but, but Daddy feels almost a bit too intimate for me. But maybe that's because I need to have a more intimate re relationship with God. You know, not just, I mean, respect is great. I've noticed my, my grandchildren at the front were being a bit feral today, and their respect for their granddad was zero today, <laughs> doing what they wanted to do. But, um, but I think, it, it, of course, God is awesome. Because our Father is also in heaven and transcendent and holy. But the starting point isn't those things. The starting point is I can draw near to God like a little child can run to their loving Father. My, my son Benjamin is, uh, and his wife have uh, had a little baby boy 
uh, in the end of November. And my son Ben is besotted with that baby. I mean, he, he I was, was with him yesterday, he's just loving feeding the baby. You know, um, more important even than watching Man U play Man City was feeding the baby and carrying the baby around. And he said, I didn't think I'd enjoy it that much. I didn't think I'd be as bonded as I am. And it's wonderful to see loving fathers with their children. God is the how much more father for each of us. And so when we come to pray, we can approach God with confidence. I love a verse in Romans chapter 12, which starts, that chapter starts like this, in view of God's mercy. And then it talks about our self-offering to God. But I love that in view of God's mercy. Everything that I want to do, everything that I am, everything I want to offer to God, I want to come out of having a view of God's mercy. That's the lens with which I see God. God is a merciful God, a loving God. And if God is merciful and loving, and he's my Father, then that is going to encourage me to pray. Because I believe there's someone who's for me, and someone who has the power to change what I cannot change. And he wants to bless me even more than my human parents want to bless me. And so on that note, I just want to reflect a little bit about fasting. Because we've called this a week of prayer and fasting. And fasting can have the connotation of, I don't know, hard work, maybe feeling we've got to twist God's arm to get blessed. In fact, we've, we've actually invited the whole Woodland Church family to join us, particularly on Tuesday, for a day of fasting. Um, when, when the week of prayer and fasting was instituted way back with Rob and Pam in the 1980s, it was always called a week of prayer and fasting. We've kind of softened it a little bit, called it week of prayer. And maybe that's because we haven't fully understood about fasting and, and what, what place does that have in our lives. And um, I just want to reflect a little bit about fasting because for me, uh, I think it is a really important discipline. And it's good to give time to. And it may well be that in our culture we think, oh, fasting, isn't that a bit masochistic? You know, why would I do that to myself? Or we might think, is it a bit dangerous to fast? You know, is that bad for me? I don't think it's bad for us to fast, actually, in, in right measures. I think it's actually probably good for us. But here's what I feel about fasting. In the Old Testament, fasting was very strongly linked with trouble. When a city is besieged, people fast. When David is, is praying for his baby who, who's going to die, he's fasting. When people want to say sorry to God for things that have gone wrong, they fast. Fasting and mourning go together. In a time of bereavement and loss, you fast. And actually, that, that's very resonant with what it's like to be human, actually. When we're anxious, when we're afraid, when we're sad, we sometimes actually go off for food anyway. It's easy to fast when we're we're in that place of, of, of mourning or anxiety. But that was the, the pattern for the people of God in the Old Testament, that they fasted when they were in trouble. They, they, they did more than that. They fasted as a, as a discipline too. But a discipline that came because they were often in trouble. In the New Testament, Jesus spent a lot of time eating and drinking. And in Matthew 11, we can, we can read a little... Um, contrast that Jesus makes between himself and John the Baptist. We might have those words come up there. So Jesus says at the end of a little passage where he's talking about John the Baptist, he says, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. And the son of man came eating and drinking, and they say he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. What's the difference between John the Baptist and Jesus? John the Baptist came to prepare the way of the Lord. He was the last of the great line of prophets that were actually leading up to a time when God's own son, the Messiah, the saviour of the world, the saviour of Israel, was going to come into the world. And so John is the last of the not yet prophets. He's proclaiming, not yet, but soon. The king is coming. He's not here yet. Get ready. Repent. Get your lives aligned with the goodness of God. Come back to God if you've drifted away from him. And for John, he was, a, he, you know, he, he, he was a faster. His disciples fasted. In fact, John's disciples said to Jesus, 
why, do, why, why don't your disciples fast? John, John gets us fasting all the time. And when he does give us food to eat, it's only locusts and wild honey. You know, it wasn't, he had this ascetic lifestyle. And it's all about the not yet. The kingdom of God is not yet here. And when something's not yet, then we long for it and we groan for it and we mourn for it. We say, let your kingdom come. We, 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 we need you. We're hungry. We're desperate. The people of Israel were desperate for their freedom from oppression. They were desperate to see the restoration of the kingdom of God on earth. When Jesus comes, he's the prophet of the now. He's the prophet of the kingdom of God is at hand. The, 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 the prophet who says, how can the, the friends of the bridegroom fast when the bridegroom is with them? He's, he's saying, when the kingdom of God is here, good things happen. And therefore, it's really appropriate to feast and to celebrate. The kingdom of God is at hand with Jesus. And so you see that kind of continuum. Here's John the Baptist over here. The kingdom of God is not yet here. Here's Jesus. The kingdom of God is at hand. In fact, it's breaking out. The, the sick are being healed. The dead are being raised. The hungry are being fed. And that's just what heaven looks like. And heaven is a place of feasting, not fasting. Jesus then goes on to say, there will come a time when my followers will fast. When the bridegroom is taken away, then they'll fast. And he was talking, of course, about his crucifixion, a time of mourning, a time of sadness, a time of loss. So all of those things, for me, that informs the way I pray and fast. I don't pray thinking, oh, God's my father, but I've got to please him by showing that I'm really keen. I think I'll fast. I'm not praying, God's my father, but um, you know, I need to earn some, some, some credit with him. And, and maybe if I don't eat, that, that's going to work. When I fast, I'm, I'm saying to God, oh, I'm longing for you, God. You've called me to intimacy with you. And yet, there's pain, there's distance, there's need for breakthrough. I need breakthrough in my life. I fast for breakthrough. I fast asking God for the not yet of the kingdom to become the now. This week, I'll spend a little bit of time fasting. And one of, one, one of the people I'm fasting for is, is someone in our congregation who's had a profound relapse into very destructive mental illness. And it doesn't seem like we're getting anywhere. We're trying to support and befriend her as a church. We're not getting very far. Mental health services are not getting far. It seems to be getting worse, not better. I want to fast and pray, God, will there be some breakthrough for this person? That's for someone in the life of our community. We can fast for breakthrough. We can fast for revival and renewal. We can fast for where, where, where a, a, a community or a city or a nation seems far from God. Father God, we seem far from you. And we're in trouble. It's not been a great year for the world, has it? And in Romans chapter 8, Paul writes and says, it's like the whole world is groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Even we who have the first fruits of the Spirit are longing for the fullness of what we don't yet have. We're longing for the kingdom to come. We don't yet have it. There will be a day when we can feast, but right now we're fasting. So we fast for the breakthrough, fast for situations in our lives, in our church, in our community, in our wider world. Lord God, in those situations, may your kingdom come. When God's blessing, when God's poured out, then we feast and we celebrate. And that's why, for us, a picture of the kingdom that we have week by week, and we're going to be doing that in a moment, is communion. Because that's a sign of where we're going. It's a sign of a wedding banquet. It's a sign of the bridegroom is close and, and we're, we're, God is with us and we're going to feast together. And so I'm actually going to lead us into a time where we, we do some of that now. We're going to have communion together. And when we do that, we're thinking about the now and the not yet. We're thinking that we're anticipating and looking forward to all that will come. We're celebrating the fact that in our pain and sorrow now, God is with us. But there's room for crying out for what we don't yet have because the Father loves us and he's a good father all the time so let me say a prayer really for just to sum up some of what i've been trying to say to you this morning if i may father god i pray that this week you'd open our eyes to your mercy more than we've seen before thank you god that you are the god and father of our lord jesus christ 
Thank you, God, that you're the, the one who runs towards prodigals and doesn't hide from them. Thank you, Father God, that you're the one that blesses those who are in trouble. You're the one who came because we needed salvation and rescuing. Thank you, God, that you're rich in mercy. And in view of your mercy, we can offer ourselves to you without fear or reservation. We can trust ourselves into your hands because you're good all the time. So we come to you like little children today. We run to you with our hands up. We ask that you lift us up out of wherever we've been brought low. In Jesus' name, amen. As we take communion, there's going to be two stations where there'll be grape juice and bread. And there'll be gluten-free bread available. If you need that, you can ask for one of the servers to get that for you. And um, as we go back into worship, you won't be ushered. But just in, in your own time, if you'd like to, do come to one of the tables. And when you're doing that, when you come to a table, you'll be saying something to God. You'll be saying to God, I believe in you. And I want to, to be your disciple. I want to be in a place of friendship and love with you. You're saying to God, um, I want you to recalibrate me. If I've you know, not kept my promises to you, I'm just saying again, I want to start again with you. And you're saying to God as well, I, I want to ask you to give me strength for the journey and fill me again with your spirit so that I can be your witness in the world. So I'm going to lead us in a little prayer of confession where we say to God, we're sorry for anything that's spoiled his image in us. And then I'm going to ask you to say with me a little acclamation, which is simply these words, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. That's a pricey of the whole gospel story that the Saviour came into the world and died for us. And we remember that when we take communion. But we're also remembering that today he's risen. And for us, mourning has turned into celebration. And that one day he's going to come back. And when he returns, wrong will be right. And all that we've longed for and fasted for and prayed for will be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Father God, we're so sorry that in many ways we don't keep our own promises to you. And sometimes we've do, done things that we shouldn't have done. We've hurt you or hurt ourselves or hurt other people. Or we've failed to do things that you've asked us to do. And we know that. But we want to thank you, Father God, that you're rich in mercy. And that we could always find forgiveness and cleansing in you. So today, Lord God, cleanse us through the blood of Jesus. And fill us again with your Holy Spirit. Amen.